Hi there, and welcome to this week's lesson. Uh, so this is week three of my course, Develop Your Drawing, uh, building on my last course where we looked at sort of different drawing techniques and approaches to drawing. And so far this course, we've been looking at watercolors, um, but today we're gonna go back to drawing and uh, we're gonna have a look at how to start to work a bit larger, okay? So again, all of this is optional. You know, these are all just ideas to work with. Um, but something changes when you start to draw on a bigger scale. So I've got a great exercise for you this week. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, I was up at my studio yesterday and uh, had a go at it. And uh, I was really, you know, I was it, it took a while for it to get going. But once it did, I was really pleased with the results I got. So I will show you those in a minute. So just to outline where this course is coming from. So another book um i just put this there in case you're interested 100 creative drawing ideas and um this is sort of where you know most of my classes in fact most of my classes i teach um and the classes i've been doing online a lot of my focus tends to be on technique and the ideas of observation and representation okay um but of course there's a whole other area to art and drawing and that is once you've developed these skills, you know, what are you going to do with them? You know, what are you going to explore? And of course, this is a massive subject. Um, but one of the great ways into it is with sort of projects um, where you start to um, think about things and allow ideas to unfold. So this is why this book's really good. It's got some ideas, all of which, you know, sort of um, can give you ideas away from just the simple I'm going to set something up in front of me and draw it to the best of my ability. OK, there's lots of ways that you can explore drawing um, and, you know, it's a sort of endless possibilities. But this book's got some great ideas. So. This week, we're looking at an exercise called seeing the world differently. OK, and uh, this sort of feeds into the idea that um, we have the idea that when we represent the world, when we draw a cup, you know, we, we basically see a cup. But you will have noticed this, that often when you draw anything like last week, we were looking at trees, the drawings start to they say more about the subject than, say, simply a photograph might. So the act of observing the world and recording it through drawing tends to sort of transform the world okay um and this is a really interesting idea um to explore so this exercise seeing the world differently okay so i'm going to just read out the instructions to you this is what i i used and we can sort of go into it in a bit more detail uh finding new meaning by drawing something small and making it big OK, so this is um, well, I'll read out the instructions. He says many instructors recognize that requiring a particular point of view enables students to see the world differently. Mark Dennis, who came up with this exercise, asked his class to greatly enlarge what they observe and thus find new meaning in it. OK, so we're interested in how um, when you take something small and then you draw it large, it's basically changes it somewhat. We relate to it in a different way. Um, and that's a, just a really interesting area uh, to explore. So in detail, um, he says, draw anything that is small, even bordering on tiny, natural or man-made, and make it big. Uh, magnify its detail in proportion to the enlargement. This enormous change of scale could make a four foot by four foot drawing of a wren skull have the impact of a landscape or the austere quality of a steel grey winter's sky. Uh, a three foot by five foot drawing of a portion of electric cord could have a serpentine mystery and the provocative nature of the unknown. As Henry Geldzahler noted, the pop artists play with transformation of scale and interest in everyday objects and images isolated typified and intensified their subject matter so if you know pop art um certainly pop art um some of the artists would work on these incredibly large canvases and there he's talking about four foot by four foot drawings and um 
so forth. Now, I'm not going to suggest that you work that big. I think up until now, though, we've been working more like A4 pages, uh, maybe A3. Um, so I did mine on A2. Uh, no, I think I went to A1, but I might have reduced it slightly. So just go as big as you feel comfortable. Um, you're going to need, obviously, a drawing board. Obviously, most um, sketchbooks will come with a sort of solid enough back that you can actually draw on. Um, I took mine to the studio and had it on an easel. And that also enabled me to work upright. And when you start to work bigger, um, you tend to start to use your body more. So when you're sitting at a table and you've got your, your pen out, um, it's a bit like the your body is a bit like in the same position as if you were writing a letter. And that can tend to make work maybe a bit cramped, a bit tight, a bit small. So one of the great things about working big is you can sort of step back from your work and you can start to use your arm in these big emotions. And uh, that adds like expressive energy to the work that you won't, you'll find it more difficult to recreate at a smaller scale. Okay, but yeah, you don't have to go to um, four foot by four foot. So he says, allow the object you're drawing to fill your visual field and your whole consciousness. As you zoom in, you will notice surface details, small cracks, pocking, specks of dust, bumps, hair, and so on. Observe the highlights, glossy or matte, textures and graduations of tone. While your drawing must be rendered in a representational and realistic manner, its completed state could very well border on abstraction. It must enable the viewer to identify the subject but it should also hint at a metaphorical or symbolic reference. So that all may sound a little bit sort of, you know, sort of what's he going on about. Um, and of course, if you've ever done, um, if you've studied art at college or, you know, when I was at university, um, art can sort of start to go down the rabbit hole of sort of philosophy. But what he's saying basically is, you know, take something small, and I'll give you some sort of suggestions in a minute um, and get really zoomed up close to it. And then when you draw it, you're looking to basically draw it relatively accurately. But the change of scale should make it read as something other. OK, so what I used um, is the example in the book, which is popcorn. OK, so popcorn is an excellent um, sort of subject for this exercise because it's such an unusual sort of varied form. And of course, blown up, popcorn looks almost uh, like clouds or it's just very unusual structures. Um, and so part of this exercise is, you know, I want you to sort of discover um, something that might be of interest to you. But um, things you could look at are uh, nuts, seeds, um, again, pebbles, unusual stones. Um, bits of bark, um, organic forms, um, the inside of fruit might make uh, for a sort of good area of study. Um, just little bits of things that you've got in your pocket. Um, all sorts, like marbles would be a good one. Um, so you're going into this, the world of the miniature, and you're sort of looking at it closely, and then you're blowing it up to something uh, sort of different, okay? So that's also part of the exercise. Now, I will give you um, links to some of my reference photos. And of course, you can just pick up popcorn and have a go at that. Um, but also see today's class, um, this week's exercise, as also starting to exercise creativity. OK, and also think that what we're after here isn't just about representation. We're just also interested in creating something um that is interesting um, from the viewer's point of view so i remember going to an art gallery once and talking about sort of art and this sort of thing and um, the sort of work they had in there tended to be somewhere between abstract and representation so it wasn't completely um non-representational is that you could sort of work out what things were but things weren't portrayed in a um, sort of realistic manner, I would say. Um, and I was talking about this to the chap who owned the gallery, and he was saying that um, often what you're trying to do is you're trying to invite the viewer to look again. OK, so when you create an artwork, 
it's almost as if you don't want everything to be spelled out on first view okay it's not like you've seen it once you sort of get what it is and that's it there's a if you can introduce certain degree of ambiguity or maybe something about the context or this strange viewpoint um, it creates curiosity and so people want to look at the image again and again and they'll they'll make different connections um, so you sort of create something that has a sort of openness um, that is then open to interpretation and that's really interesting for people um, to look at and explore okay so hopefully some of these ideas might become more apparent to you as you work through the exercise this week anyway so um, yeah I'm going to uh, show you what I got up to in my studio. I did a couple of these exercises and uh, I'll talk you through those. I was working with um, the water soluble charcoal that I mentioned, big charcoal blocks. I'll put the link down below uh, with, mix, I would say, mixed results. I was using a bit of water because they are water soluble and that did add to some of the texture, but I certainly didn't feel in control of it. Um, but again, don't let that worry you, you know, just have fun with this. As you see, I was working big and expressive um, and, you know, I would invite you to do the same. If anything, because I was filming, I was working fairly briskly. Um, I think if I was to do the, ex um, the exercises again, I might spend a little bit longer on them. OK, I think I would get a bit more involved in this observation of detail and just really let the transformation of scale do the work. Anyway, I'll let you make up your own mind. But uh, yeah, see how you get on. OK, so here I am over at the studio. So a nice large piece of paper. Um, if you can work with your paper um, vertical like that, I think it will really help you if you want to explore a more um, expressive style in your drawing. Um, as you can see, I'm using those large charcoal blocks, um, which really lend themselves to this sort of um, interesting mark making and sort of working in a larger format. Uh, and you can see my reference uh, material there, the popcorn. So as I say, feel free to use popcorn, um, but you will be, you know, if you start to look into this, um, you will be surprised at all sorts of things that might make for good subjects blown up large. So let's say the idea here isn't to distort what we're looking at, is to use the objects themselves um, drawn at a larger scale to almost be a, you know, to imply abstraction. Um, so these organic forms it lend themselves perfectly to this sort of exercise. Now, as I say, the, um, those charcoal blocks are water soluble and I did spray some water on there. Um, but overall, I wasn't getting a great um, effect. Uh, that could just be because the, war, uh, the paper wasn't stretched, and so I was a bit reluctant to put loads of water on. But uh, I say, uh, interesting media to use, and I've used them before. And that you know, you do get interesting mark making. So you should, when I show you the pictures at the end, you'll be able to see some of perhaps the effects that I managed to get. So my first pass with that sort of slightly ochre colour, um, that was really just to try and establish a general feel for the tonal arrangement. So um, a bit like we did last week um, with the uh, working with the, the flat washers. Um, Say so initially you're establishing big shapes, um, large light and dark um, sort of colours, and then going on with detail. So with this sort of drawing, I'm continually sort of going through a process of um, adding and sort of subtracting. Everything is done in a fairly loose manner. And the idea is you tighten it up as you go along. This is opposed to, for example, starting off with, um, you know, getting one of those popcorn pieces and trying to draw it as accurately as possible. Um, initially, the marks, I say, are nice and loose and general um, with the aim to potentially tightening everything up later on. And there you can see I'm just smudging it out. And this is a technique that I've talked about a lot in my classes. I call it, um, you're basically, um, you sort of destroy the artwork and rebuild it. Okay, so you're adding and subtracting. Um, and in the sort of messing it up, 
things can emerge that you might not otherwise get through a more sort of a tighter way. Um, it's also great for the charcoal because it adds some tone and allows me to uh, use the rubber if needed. So we've skipped ahead here slightly. Um, my filming, I sort of ran out of uh, memory, so I've had to skip slightly ahead. And as you can see, I've been building it up. And again, just continually looking at my reference material, uh, not deliberately trying to create abstraction um, and just sort of seeing what happened really. But throughout the whole thing, I try to keep, um, you know, keep up a nice sort of pace and a rhythm with the drawing. Um, so as to not get bogged down in any particular area. Um, but this could easily be done, as I say, in a more, you know, in a much more accurate way than I've done here. I, I think this is more towards the idea of a sort of gestural sort of drawing, really. And uh, yeah, working into it. So when you're working big, you have to just take this. Um, you have to take a sort of relaxed attitude towards it. Um, this is why stepping back from it, seeing the thing as a whole, uh, using a cloth to wipe it, mess it up, um, this all helps get you in the mindset of um, the drawing. I say everything can be sort of built on and developed, but you should always feel free to move things and change things, and that will add interest to your drawing. So that was my first attempt. And I, you know, I was quite pleased with that, um, but I felt some of the forms were a bit vague. Um, now, what you can't see here um, is I still actually had some of the um, popcorn to hand. So this is a single piece of popcorn. I actually thought maybe the single piece might give me um, something more to work on. So I decided to isolate a single piece and what struck me about it was it had this sculptural quality and that somewhat put me in mind of those Henry Moore sculptures, you see. So I thought maybe trying to create the um, a sort of viewpoint of it being almost like on a plinth or something might give me an interesting composition to work with. And then I say, I quite like this. This is just more of a, um, you know, it was on a, a dark background, um, but certainly, you know, it's best if possible, you know, it helps to include a background or some sort of space around the object. It helps to bring it into focus. So it's quite a nice compositional idea, this. Um, it allows the object, the thing that you're interested in to be illuminated. So it becomes like the lightest, uh, that's where the lights are, which is where the interest is. So you can really see here how the charcoal blocks uh, lend themselves to these bigger drawings. Um, just that I can cover the ground quite quickly. And uh, here I'm using a bit of tissue paper um, just to sort of rub into it and uh, create some blending effects. Okay, so we've had to again sort of skip forward slightly um, and you can see the drawing has come along. I did actually add some water to it so um, the paper did buckle slightly and uh, created some in basically interesting marks, okay? And uh, as I talked about in my, um, my lessons on texture and mark making, you know, adding interesting marks will really bring a sort of study to life here. And although, I say, I am trying to draw a piece of popcorn, um, those marks and the sort of strange quality of the form is all sort of really trying to, you know, the changing of scale makes it, takes it on this sculptural quality. I think that's what interested me about this one. And that sort of curved piece at the top almost looks like it could be a head or something like that. And that's what becomes really interesting with this is about how when the mind's um, faced with these sort of random shapes, it will try to read things into it. And there you can see I'm really um, trying to get some water on there, trying to get this, this water soluble uh, effect um, to happen and letting some of these drips come down. And even using a paintbrush. 
Um, so yeah, I, again, I, so, so some of the um, the charcoal was staying a bit more dry. Um, so I wouldn't see this as the, the most uh, definitive demonstration of these water soluble charcoal. But if you do decide to give them a go, you know, um, let me know. Let me know in the comments how you get on, whether you sort of find them useful or not. I mean, they're excellent as a sort of dry medium anyway. Um, but I do think there is some potential there with the, uh, the water soluble effect. And as you can see, just building up forms slowly allowing sort of the forms to emerge and again keeping the rhythm of the drawing ticking along so it could almost be a sort of rocky outcrop or sort of thing you might see in australia or sort of parts you know african deserts or something like that So I say in the instructions, he says, you know, get interested in the little, the textual qualities. So again, this is a bit like with the tree drawing. Now having established the big masses, I can add some marks uh, just to imply sort of texture and sort of surface qualities. So that was my second one. Just adding a few marks in there just to try and help sort of lock it in. Oh, the other thing I thought this sort of brought to mind was like large graffiti pieces, um, sort of lettering. Um, again, it just has that sort of like perhaps that flow of sort of shape, that sort of rhythm to it, um, which you might sort of see in sort of graffiti writing. Obviously, it doesn't say anything, but. Okay, and so my last one, I decided to go back to a favourite approach, which is um, I'm starting here with vine charcoal and then decided to build up the forms using compressed charcoal. So there goes the compressed charcoal. So I really like compressed charcoal. I think I've mentioned it before in my videos. It's more like chalk than... Um, perhaps this sort of crumbly, sort of looser charcoal. Um, if you start off with the dark shapes, um, then you can establish your darks very quickly, and then you can use the cloth to basically um, to soften those, and then you've got something to work into. So I'm sort of, in this initial sort of laying down of the form, um, I'm basically trying to separate um, the composition into just black and white okay no subtlety and then now I can start to work into it if you're interested in where the reference came actually this piece of popcorn can be found within the reference photo that you can see in front of you there if you see it's sort of like in the foreground um, a piece of uh, popcorn there so I decided to actually zoom in even further on my reference and just pick out that single piece as a uh, as a starting place for this drawing. I like the way that the light was sort of cutting across the form and uh, really bringing out some of that texture. It reminds me, I heard a story once, I think it was about Gainsborough. Um, that Gainsborough, when he was practicing landscapes, he would use bits of coal um, for rocky outcrops and things like broccoli for sort of trees and actually set up landscapes using sort of miniature um, items like that and then draw the whole thing as if drawing a proper landscape. And you could see quite easily how these bits of popcorn could become sort of stand-ins for um, sort of strange rock formations. So I'm looking forward to seeing what people do with this exercise. Um, it's a bit different from the other things that we've looked at in that we're starting to sort of get into the realms of abstraction and uh, sort of thinking about, you know, the effect we have on the viewer and uh, this thing about um, deliberately introducing a certain degree of ambiguity. Um, 
So although these those could be seen as the sort of things you might do, you know, sort of as an advanced artist, I think they're things that you can think about. You know, all art is to some extent abstraction. You've taken, you've simplified the visual world um, into a two-dimensional surface. Um, and I often talk about the importance of learning to simplify and simplification and abstraction could be thought of as uh, sort of two sides of the same coin, really. So there we go. So I'm using the putty rubber there, which as you know, is a sort of favorite approach of mine. So removing the lights as opposed to drawing the darks. And uh, by sort of scratching into it like that, it really helps to sort of almost create this sense of um, three-dimensional form. Interestingly, if uh, any of you saw this image, I've uploaded it to Instagram and uh, I called it monolith because again this is a sort of I don't know whether I was being sort of tongue-in-cheek in that but I remember um, when I was studying art at college there was a chap and he used to create abstract art and he would give his works very sort of poetic titles and of course the the abstraction lends a certain degree of ambiguity but then also the title that you give a work can sort of steer the audience uh, to make sort of um, perhaps connections or ideas. Um, so I called this monolith because I thought it looked like a standing stone, but I also thought maybe it had almost like a figurative quality to it with that sort of round um, bit sticking out the side, almost looking like a head, sort of like a sort of head and shoulders on the diagonal as if we were looking up. Um, and again, completely unknown to me when I sort of started the subject. But this is the thing is that something has then emerged. Um, and once these things have emerged, you could then sort of bring them out or make more of them. And this is the sort of interesting, um, it's almost like um, this sort of dialogue with the subconscious, which is, you know, partly sort of what uh, abstract art surrealism was all about. So there we go. So three examples for you. Uh, quite large. As you say, all of them I cropped down, but feel free to work as large as you feel comfortable. And I thought what I would do is I'll just show you the finished pieces in isolation um, to allow you to make your own mind up. So here's the first one. Now, it might be that abstract art or this sort of thing isn't your cup of tea. Um, these things work really on the basis of mark making and, uh, I say, this sort of strange quality of not quite being able to read what you're looking at. But as you can see, you know, I was quite pleased with that. And uh, I thought they all had something interesting, you know, and could be jump off places for sort of uh, more considered pieces. So that was the uh, popcorn as sculpture, which takes on this rather interesting form. And then finally this one, which I think was the one I was most happy with, the individual piece of popcorn. As you can see, nice sort of textures and marks there. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting and it gives you some ideas to uh, try out for yourself. Um, so I will be here on Friday to look at my students' work, having a go at this uh, exercise, and uh, I will see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.